you hand it over. Thank oh. you, Siri. Uh, you are being recorded, all of you, um, and we're going to uh, have this on record. You can find all of our tastings on the Vimeo page if you want to access any of the older ones um, that you may have missed or if you just want to go back and hear somebody's story. Uh, and without further ado, Miss Brianne Day from Day Wines, uh, one of our new favorite wineries of 2021. Um, we've loved everything that we've tasted from her so far. Very, very allocated, very small production. Uh, in some cases, just 10 or 20 cases coming to the state of Georgia uh, for us all to try to fight over. Um, and thank you for being here. Hey, thank you for having me here. I'm happy to be here. Um, and thank you to everybody um, who who's a part of this tasting as well and actually uh, caring about what we do. It's, it's very cool. Um, I started Day Wines in 2012 uh, officially after years of working around various aspects in the industry. Um, when I look back on my life at this point, it's for one thing, it's crazy when you get to be about 40, how like, 20 years can go into something and the idea that I've done something for that long or cared about something for that long is just surprises me all the time but I got um, interested in wine as a teenager I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and my folks moved to uh, the Willamette Valley area when I was 16 and I had this instant um, attraction to grape growing and uh, I used to I had my first car, my driver's license, and I didn't know anybody. I had no friends in the area. So I would just take drives all over the place and I'd either end up in wine country, just looking at things or trying to get lost in Portland. And I'd go to Powell's books or to, the music scene was very good in Portland in the late nineties. So, you know, that was uh, another thing that, that I was into. Um, and when I was in my early, uh, well, my late teens, I went to Italy for the first time uh, my first international trip and in northern Italy I um, I wasn't there for wine at all I was I was there as a part of kind of a religious mission um, and I was supposed to be preaching to English-speaking people and wound up falling in love with wine and with food and art and Italian boys and all of the uh, all of the things that make Italy so great um, so I was in a little um, bodega um, in uh, on the shores of Lake Como, and that was kind of the first place that I first tasted real wine. And um, what really, I, I don't remember exactly what we were tasting. I remember they were all reds, and they were all these uh, Northern Italian light-bodied reds. They were probably like, it was probably like Gattinara and stuff like that, because the guy that I was tasting with kept saying things like this only grows in this specific village. They only do it. He kept saying all these onlys. And I got, what I took away from that was this real sense of pride and a sense of um, self and culture that that man experienced through the wines of that region. And that really hit me hard because uh, growing up in suburban Pacific Northwest, I didn't really feel like we had those kinds of things. And, and later, as I thought about it more, I, I came to identify things that we do have like that in the Pacific Northwest. But at the time, it felt like, man, everything is Applebee's and strip malls. Like what, you know, we don't have what they have. And it was really um, appealing to me. On that trip, every village that I went to, I would ask, what is the wine you make here? And they would always have something that was like, this is the wine we do here. And I went home with a case and a half of wine in my backpack. And over the next like several years, um, every once in a while I'd open wine. I, I had no idea how to age wine or anything, but I just knew that older was better. And so, you know, it would taste things here and there. And the interest really started developing in my early twenties. And um, I was working um, other jobs. Um, I was married really young and was putting my ex-husband through college and um, was just kind of like doing whatever I need to do to pay the bills. So I was doing project management for a design agency for a while and 
Um, I did mortgages for a while. And it's interesting how a diverse employment background can really translate into um, company ownership, like owning a business. And I, I had no idea that I was like developing skills that I would still be using now um, with owning a winery, but that's how it worked out. Um, and through uh, the whole time he was in, in college, I was saving really hard because I was super wanderlusty and really needed to travel. And um, by the time he graduated, I, I knew we wanted to go to wine producing regions as, as our journey and um, that there was, I, that I wanted to be involved in the wine industry in some capacity, but I didn't know what that was yet. And so we uh, worked in exchange for a room and board in some places, like our first country was New Zealand and um, worked in exchange for room and board uh, at vineyards mostly. We tasted and talked to vineyard managers and we had a blog that was called 1000wines.org and we had this goal of tasting a thousand wines and documenting them and ended up tasting about 1500 wines through the course of the journey. But really early on in the uh, trip, the very first country in New Zealand, I realized that when a person who was talking about their wines used certain um, ways of describing it, I, I always responded, like had like a physical visceral response to those wines over other wines. And those were when they would be organic or biodynamically grown. And when they were made with native fermentation and low sulfur use and unfined and unfiltered and all of these things that it, it didn't take long. Even if people didn't tell me how they made the wine after a while, I started getting kind of cocky about it. And I'd be like, that's native fermentation, isn't it? That's like, I started to just recognize because I would feel something physically in response to those wines. Um, we went around New Zealand and Australia, Southeast Asia, and then around Western and Eastern Europe. And because uh, I was so kind of dialed around in, um, to, and then went around South America after that. But by the time we got to France, um, I was pretty uh, set on the idea of only going to wineries that produced wine in that way. And met this retailer in Paris who gave me a book um, that was a guide to natural wines of France. Um, and this was like before, I don't even know if they called it natural wine. It was kind of before the natural wine movement. This, this was like 06, 07. Um, but we did get invited to a tasting of some of the original, like the, the what do they call them? The They don't call it the Fab Four, do they? The Beaujolais producers, but... Um, the gang of four, those guys. Yes. Um, I got invited to a tasting in Paris um, that was all of those dudes. And I had no idea that that was like a big deal. I didn't at all. I was just like, okay, cool. Let's taste. Like, I didn't know. I wasn't impressed. It wasn't like starstruck. I like I might would be now. Um, but anyhow, um, that was really cemented uh, in my mind that that was the right way to make wine. It wasn't... Um, it was just like, I wanna make the best wine possible and that's how you do it. Um, so when I came home to Oregon at the beginning of 2008, I knew I wanted to be a winemaker. I wanted to make them in a minimal uh, intervention style from organic or biodynamic fruit. And I wanted to own my own winery. Those were the things that I had kind of figured out. Um, so I started winemaking classes at the local uh, community college and did the first term. And then I started working for uh, a winery called Brooks that's out here that has a biodynamic vineyard. And I was so eager to work a harvest and get my hands dirty and everything that I left and um, worked three months in New Zealand, my first harvest and learned a ton um, by doing um, in-person, you know, actual physical work that so much so that I um, started doing two harvests a year in Southern hemisphere, Northern hemisphere, or like in 2011, I was able to work a full harvest in Burgundy and then come home and had two weeks off and did a full harvest in Oregon because Oregon was super late that year and France was super early. Um, but in the meantime, around harvest, which I ended up working about six months of a year um, doing harvest, I worked in a lot of other aspects of the industry to kind of get the, the experience. So I managed a tasting room um, for the Irie Vineyards and I uh, started working front of house in restaurants. I was in Argentina in 2010, oh, 20, 
yeah, 2010, um, work and harvest and was thinking about what do I want to do when I go home to Portland? Where are there gaps in my, in my education? And I thought, well, I have no idea how to sell wine to fine dining customers, which is where I want to, to sell it. Um, so I reached out to three restaurants in Portland and got hired at a place that's super celebrated in Portland called La Pigeon. It was my first restaurant job and um, really viewed it as a way to, well, for one, get to understand the restaurant industry, but also to talk to diners about why they're choosing what they're choosing. And um, I think working in restaurants at that point in my career, right before I started my, my winery was actually one of the reasons why I've made a lot of the wines that I make because I've really viewed them with pairings in mind, particularly in, in restaurant settings. Um, and uh, so I, I also worked uh, in retail. I worked a little bit in distribution and I worked for a French cooperage selling barrels for about a year and a half. And that was also really, really valuable because I was able to travel around. I covered the Pacific Northwest and then new business development in other states in the country um, and tasting so many different climates of wine and so many different varieties of wine with the same barrels was really, really interesting to uh, see how the wood interacts with the wine. I feel like that actually was a, a really good primer for having my own winery. So in 2012, I was working um, for a winemaker out here named John Groshaw. He has a winery called Groshaw Cellars, one of the nicest people in the business. And um, I, uh, I was still working front of house for um, one restaurant at that time and retail and bought my first two tons of um, Pinot Noir. And uh, it it, it went well. I mean, one of my goals was always to make vineyard and vintage specific wines and Pinot is a grape that's very um, able to communicate those things well. And uh, so that's kind of where I thought I was going to be is like making mostly single vineyard Pinots, but um, the restaurant experience and the travel experience and then becoming aware that there are so many different things being grown in Oregon, sometimes in really micro amounts. And in some cases, you know, older vineyards that have been blended into blends and never even gotten the varietal uh, specification on the labels before. Uh, I didn't realize how much of that was out there until I started getting more involved with it. Um, when my first vintage was in barrel, I was working four jobs to pay for my second vintage, which was, uh, I had two full-time restaurant jobs, a day a week retail, and then I was working um, for John in his cellar. And at one of my restaurant jobs, I waited on a table and they spotted uh, my grape tattoo that um, takes up the majority of my arm um, and started asking me about it, uh, why I had it. And I started telling them about the travels and, um, you know, the passion that I have for wine and, and what I was hoping to do. And through the course of their dinner, their questions got a little bit more specific about business related things. And at the end of their dinner, um, the older gentleman kind of leaned back and said, I'm going to be your backer. And I was like, internally, very skeptical. I was like, okay, thank you. Um, because I was like assessing you know, how many bottles of wine did they drink? And he's feeling pretty generous right now. But um, I made plans with them to meet later in the week. And two days later, uh, presented a business plan I had written and a projected 10 year budget. And I decided to really kind of give them the big version of what I was going for, because I thought, if this scares them off, they're probably not the right people for me. And um, so that's what I did. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I was able to grow the brand a lot faster with their help than I would have been able to by working four jobs. Um, <laughs> any amount. There's certain things you just can't do unless you have backers. And um, so that was really a clutch moment for me. Um, so yeah, this will be my 10th harvest on the brand and we're making 15,000 cases of wine this year. We started with um, 125 cases 10 years ago. And like you mentioned, most of those are in very small quantities. So it's 15,000 cases, but it's 25 wines. 
because <laughs> I'm loony um, and we're working with 30 vineyards. Um, it's a lot to keep track of, but uh, it's uh, it's fun. And it, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't have it any other way. So that's where we are. We started selling wine in Georgia just this past year. And I've been having a really, uh, you know, successful run of it with Georgia. I know um, the Atlanta area has always had a really good reputation as being very supportive of Willamette Valley wines and uh, and yeah, I can't wait to come and do a do a sales trip out there. Hey, we can't wait either. Uh, and that story is absolutely amazing. Uh, I think one of the best winemaker uh, journeys that I've ever heard before. And hats <laughs> off to you uh, as a small yeah. business owner and as somebody who's uh, had a similar journey. Um, it's pretty awesome to be where you are now. Uh, and it shows where you've come from so thank oh, you thank for sharing you. that with us because that's pretty amazing I was in tears at one point literally not not saying that as a sarcastic but um just beautiful beautiful story uh and it makes thank sense why you. the wines are so beautiful well, thank you I I really appreciate you saying that it's uh yeah it's been nuts it really has but it's um it's such a passion for me and I've always wondered if at some point it would become not a passion to where it um, just becomes work and I'm not there yet at all. Uh, it's like that rabbit hole is a deep one. So, yep. and I am in it. Yep. And now my little son, he was, he was born uh, four weeks before harvest in 2017. So he will be four in August, but it'll be his fifth harvest. Um, and he's right there with me every step of the way, every vineyard visit. And uh, it's really, given a whole different um, kind of weight and heft to um, a meaning of what I'm trying to do because uh, it's not, it feels like so much is what I'm trying to do for him. So it's, uh, it's become really cool. That's awesome. All right, let's get in some wines. Yes. So this is Queen D. Um, you'll find as I'm talking about my wines, they all have names uh, for there's a story behind every single name um, and oftentimes a person behind those names. So my sister, um, her name is Denesha. My parents were very young and creative when they named her. And, um, and so Dee is my sister and she is not a wine person really at all. She is a uh, emergency department um, physician's assistant, um, but she's uh, you know, my big sister and, and I admire the hell out of her. And, when we go out to dinner together, or even when she's out to dinner by herself, she'll text me a photo of the wine list and be like, you know what I like, what should I order? And so this wine was created for her palate um, because I know what she likes. <laughs> and so that's why it's named for her. Um, the fruit comes from uh, Cowhorn Vineyard, which was the first biodynamic vineyard in Southern Oregon. It's in the Applegate Valley AVA, which is um, just north of the California border. It's a higher elevation AVA. Um, ground level sits around 1500 feet elevation because it's real mountainous down there. And it's, um, I don't know if you, you've ever traveled in Northern California or Southern Oregon, but it's like a really densely wooded area. There are little like areas of clearing where you'll see like uh, a ranch or a cow pasture. Now all of those are being turned into hemp farms. Um, just tons of weed being farmed everywhere down there right now. The air smells like it, uh, especially in the summer. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, that's Southern Oregon. Um, it looks kind of like uh, what you would have imagined, like people coming over on the Oregon Trail were going through like the really wooded, hilly kind of areas with little winding rivers through everywhere. So um, Bill and Barbara Steele uh, planted Cowhorn Vineyard, um, I want to say in the mid 90s. And they, um, I found some of your, uh, your, your pairings interesting, especially the spinach and artichoke dip, because they also were one of the most um, well known or main supplier of uh, biodynamic asparagus 
um, in the area and sell uh, sell a lot of asparagus to several restaurants in Portland and in San Francisco. Um, and I've never seen anybody call out spinach and artichoke, but for me, it's kind of in that same zone as like asparagus. So I thought that was really interesting knowing that that's something else that's farmed right on the site there. Um, oh, well, thank you. Cause a lot of the times the, the pairings are a lot of Aliyah's hungry late at night. So what would I want to, <laughs> what, what would I dream up in this scenario? So I'm, I'm glad to approve. Cheese, right? <laughs> I've never had fried goat cheese. That sounds delicious. <laughs> oh, well, that's what we do in the South is if it's, if it can be fried, it will, and it will be delicious. So nice. when you come, we will do fried goat cheese. Awesome, because I can't really eat cow cheese, but I'm all over the goat, so <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so it's about 50-50 Marsan and Roussan. Um, those are varieties that don't get uh, a lot of uh, play or a lot of love, uh, largely. There's just a lot of people don't know much about them, but they're um, very traditional um, Rhone Valley varieties. Um, and, there, there are areas uh, in the Rhone that are just Marsan. And I think that's a, I think it's a very interesting grape. I think that in the right climate and picked at the right amount of sugar and the right ripe, ripeness level, um, it can really drink the way um, Chardonnay does or something that has a little more, that has body, but has acid both at the same time. Um, and that's something that I get in this one. When we picked it, I believe it was just 20, 21 bricks, 20.5, something like that. So the 12% alcohol that it shows on the label is true. It's not a high alcohol wine. I know sometimes um, it's a, those are varieties that can get a little bigger and viscous and blousey if they're grown in hot parts of California or even parts of Southern Rhone. But in the Applegate Valley, um, it tends to be uh, more textural and nuanced than that, in my opinion. Um, I like that it has like, a bit of a honeycomb kind of thing to it and a, like a little bit of a savory gram kind of side to it and i like that there's a some some texture some, some tannin specifically um i didn't do any real skin contact or maceration it's really direct press um and yeah we we press all of our whites uh, first to stainless steel because I have glycol chilling on the outside of it. So that's to inhibit fermentation while it's on the grow sleeves. And then after the heaviest solids um, are able to settle out, it's typically after about 36 hours to 48 hours, we then move it to um, a barrel and let it come up in temperature and begin native fermentation. So this was all fermented in 500 liter punchins. I, I like to work with punchins quite extensively um, in a lot of different varieties, um, but I do really like it for barrel fermented whites. Um, I do all of my Chardonnay also in punchins. And then it went through native fermentation and native malolactic fermentation and was uh, pulled out at 10 months and bottled with no fining or filtering. And this is, this is just how it is. <laughs> so really the only thing we did to it was uh, about 40 ppm of sulfur before bottling. It's awesome. Uh, I love Marsan and Roussan and I don't think they get enough play. Uh, and I'm actually surprised, how did you find a vineyard down in Applegate Valley that was growing Marsan and Roussan? Well, I knew about um, Cowhorn because when I was working for a house and restaurants, I sold their wines. Got and it. I had known them through that and through working in retail. And so even before I was buying fruit from them, whenever I happened to be in the Applegate Valley, I know Bar Bill and Barbara and I'd go visit them and was well aware of their wines. And I had definitely told them many, many times, if you ever want to sell fruit, I will buy fruit. Yeah. Um, and they always were like, we're never going to sell fruit, never going to sell fruit. And then in 2018, they were like, still want to buy fruit? And, yeah. and I was like, yeah. So that's how I ended up with this. Um, I only got two tons of fruit. It was like one ton of Marsan, one ton of Roussan. So really, mm -hmm. really small quantity. Um, but uh, certainly loved working with it. They recently, uh, apparently someone made an offer they couldn't refuse and they sold their vineyard um, recently. Uh, so I don't think I'll ever be able to buy fruit from them again, but uh, it was a pleasure to, to have that opportunity. It's, if you're ever in Southern Oregon, that's a it's such a it's such a wonderful site for Rhone varietals. They're growing Syrah and Grenache there, and a little bit of Viognier, and it's 
stand outstanding. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I, we did I, have one question. Oh, sorry to interrupt you, Adam. No. We did have one question from the chat. Um, Brianne, what would you pair with the Queen Bee? Food I mean, for me, I think that this wine is really versatile for um, fall flavors. Um, I mean, certainly if you want to have it in the summer, by all means, but it has some of those like golden apple notes to it. Some real gold notes that I think pair really well with uh, food that I associate with fall. Um, it could it can be a really great uh, stand in for Chardonnay with um, Thanksgiving. I like it with turkey and gamey gamey birds, um, and it also you know has uh, enough heft to it if you did want to have um, more um, cream based sauces or butter based sauces with that. It's it's fine. It's not going to get blown away by that at all. Yeah, fettuccine Alfredo all day. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I mean, if I was going fettuccine, of course, I'm I'm a Pacific Northwester, so my brain always goes to seafood, but it would be a richer seafood that I'd want with it, like halibut or yep. um, gallops, like yep. something like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and now on to the coolest wine label that I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> we are going to bring some of these T-shirts, I think, in to sell it for me. Oh, good. You should. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and I'm excited about this one. Awesome. Well, Tears of Vulcan came about because um, in 20, uh, this is, let's see, I made this the first year in 2016. So that, that year before harvest, I was drinking a lot of um, um, textural skin contact uh, whites from Sicily and Northeastern Italy, primarily, like made out of um, Zabibo and um, you know, other, other stuff that they do in those areas. And I was thinking about what could we do in Oregon that might be similar. And um, a vineyard, uh, a winery that I was friends with the winemaker, they were transitioning to all estate fruit and they were trying to find a home for some of the small growers that they had been working with. And one of them was this site in the very Northern part of the Willamette Valley in the Chehala Mountain AVA. And it, it was uh, organic since it was planted about 25 years ago, and it was planted with Viognier and Pinot Gris. And Viognier is a very unusual thing in the Willamette Valley. Um, now, with how hot it's becoming, it makes a lot more sense. But 25 years ago, it really wasn't that warm of a of a site of a spot for for Viognier. Um, and I definitely make it in a different manner than anybody who's ever gotten fruit from this site. Um, I think Scott, the grower, was completely like, what is she doing when he first had this wine? But now he thinks it's super cool. And I buy all the fruit from him at that site. So um, yeah, he thinks it's cool. But um, so the Viognier and Pinot Gris are co-fermented on skins. And then I get muscat from another organic site that's just down the road and that's direct pressed and fermented in neutral wood. And uh, then I blend them back together after, um, well, right before bottling. But the full fermentation cycle is, is on skins um, um, for the Viognier and Pinot Gris. And typically that's usually around like 21 days, but in 2020, all of my ferments went really, really fast. And so it was dry after like eight or nine days. And because we had the fire situation um, around harvest, I didn't want to do any kind of extended maceration. Uh, so we pulled, pulled it off as soon as it was dry and it ages in almost all neutral French oak. Um, I do use uh, one new acacia barrel every year and that's only, it's like one out of 24 barrels. So it's a really small percentage, but um, I think the acacia does give kind of this um, kind of waxy yellow saffrony kind of thing to it. Um, the wine is a real trip during fermentation because the aromas that come off of it are so different than anything else. So much so that, I mean, I've become used to it and I actually like watching new interns or employees as they're experiencing the fermentation because it's very strange. Um, it has this pronounced 
like mortadella smell when fermentation first kicks off. It's, it's like cured meat and black pepper. And uh, I've had two assistant winemakers be like, what, what is going on with those fermenters? And I'm like, it's in the bologna phase, <laughs> leave it alone, it's fine. Um, and then, you know, like two days later, that kind of integrates and then all these fruit aromas come out and the fruit aromas are always like white grapefruit, white peach, like just these really pronounced things. And what I have found with the wine is that in the end, all of those things are present, but it makes for a really interesting wine. Um, it's uh, labeled as such and named as such because I was thinking about like, what do Oregon and Sicily or Oregon and Northeastern Italy have in common? And the one thing I could come up with was volcanic soils. Um, so it's named for the uh, Roman god of volcanoes, who is Mr. Vulcan. And he um, he's shirtless and uh, muscly because I was sick of all the natural wine labels that had naked women on them. <laughs> and I said I was going to put naked men on mine. Um, and also, um, I had seen um, Black Sabbath right before harvest in 2016. It was like their last tour. And I... Uh, I wanted it to be kind of metal looking and that's the Black Sabbath font. So that's how the label all came together. Everything about that is perfection. <laughs> Everything about that story is amazing. It's all Agreed. true. <laughs> Agreed. So I have to ask, is Zabibo in Pithos one of your inspirations for this from Cause? Yes. In Beautiful. fact, it's an inspiration for a lot of things. I yeah. have Zabibo planted in Southern Oregon now. Uh, oh, nice. at one, of my, one of my growers planted Zabibo for me. Um, and it's not producing enough, like fruit this year, but it should be by next year. And yeah. I also have two um, Italian clay amphora that I am getting in the next couple weeks. Um, and that's what I'm gonna make it in. So that's this year, awesome. since the Zabibo is not up and running yet, yep. I'm gonna ferment Malvasia Bianca on skins in the um, amphora in one of them. And I'm gonna ferment um, a gamay and dolcetto blend in the other. Ooh. Yeah, I know, right? Nice. <laughs> and, but uh, yes, yes, definitely. That's awesome. An inspiration, definitely. I love those wines. Yeah, we do too. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we do have some in the store. Uh, I think we're down to three bottles of it. Um, the wine that we're referring to is an iconic uh, skin contact orange wine from one of the iconic producers on Sicily uh, from Cause. Uh, yep. From time to time, we also have his granddaughters, Ariana Oki Pitti's, uh, although the white has been really hard to come by the last couple of years um, in Georgia SP68 for whatever reason. Or is, she uh, a, yeah. is she the SP68? That's hers, right? She does. Yeah, the SP68 Bianco. Um, yeah. Another. That's another inspiration wine. And what I love about yep. that wine is the uh, like intense dried peach kind of flavor to it. I love that. Yeah. But the tears part of this name is actually a reference to uh, a wine from the Republic of Georgia called um, Pheasant's Tears, which was the first orange wine that I had ever had and really left uh, an impression on me. So that's why, plus, it, I don't know, it sounds more heavy metal to say tears. Of <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, I think it's so much fun and Thank delicious. You. Thank you. I think um, fun is an underrated quality in wine, and I don't know why, because if yep. it's not fun, why do it, you know, so. Amen. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, it's, it's awesome, uh, and I, I definitely want it with some coconut curry uh, and good. some jerk chicken. Both of those pairings are amazing, Aaliyah. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I agree. I built my shopping list actually around the slide deck this week, so I do have these things in my house now. Oh my god, I want to live with you. <laughs> it's really gratifying also to see uh, wines of 2020 come out okay, uh, because it was a gamble this last year to, to take all my fruit and not a lot of, a lot of people um, chose to either, you know, eliminate some of their sites or not make wine at all in Oregon. And I was pretty, I talked with a few people that I really um, trust their uh, viewpoints around the valley and 
they were like, this is our job. We're winemakers. We got to make the best of, of the situation. And that was always what I kept hearing was we got to make the best of this. And I'm like, I'm a, a real silver lining kind of person. Um, and so I just decided at some point, like, I'm going to just do it. I'm going to bring everything in. I'm going to pay all my growers. I'm not going to back out on anybody. And it's, it was a gamble. And I'm really happy when I see a wine like Tears of Vulcan come out. And because Scott, the, the grower, um, he's like the epitome of a gentleman farmer. He's an engineer or something, but he has this beautiful site um, that looks like it's plucked out of Provence. The house even is like a peachy stucco colored thing. And he's got like fruit trees all around. It's gorgeous. Um, but he said to me, none of my neighbors are picking. Everybody's just leaving it. Are you sure you want to do this? And I had taken my micro ferments out of all of my vineyard sites, which means like we went a couple weeks early before they were actually ready to be picked and did fermentations in little like five gallon buckets to replicate what was going to happen in, in the bigger fermenters. And I felt safe doing it with, with these grapes. And uh, so I was like, dude, I have to make that wine. It's one of my favorite wines. And it's just a relief to see um, it turn out like it did. Yeah, it, it, it did. Thank you for taking the gamble. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this next wine uh, is Deep Blue, and I have been wanting to make a uh, Willamette Valley Pinot um, for a few different reasons. Um, one, because I want to be able to fine tune my single vineyard Pinots a bit, and so if I have a place for barrels that don't fit into those wines to go, um, then I can I can I can I can fine tune those wines better. Um, but also because I wanted to make a wine that um, that I could sell and use some of the money to benefit uh, something that I love. And Deep Blue, um, I noticed uh, throughout the course of 2020 how often uh, I ran away to the Pacific Ocean with my kid when we needed to have some space to be outside without masks on. And, you know, when the fires were here, that was where we went to breathe. <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, the fires were really, really scary. Um, it's really, uh, it's hard to describe how, um, traumatic it is to not be able to walk outside your front door uh, in, and be able to breathe. It felt like living underwater. It was, uh, it was really, really scary. So um, I, I time and again found myself at the beach um, with my kid and that was like our safe place to, uh, to get away from those things and literally <laughs> just to be able to breathe. Um, so I, uh, I named it Deep Blue for the Pacific and I'm working on, and I haven't identified anything concretely, but I'm working on finding some kind of grassroots um, uh, organizations that are trying to rehabilitate and clean up the Pacific. And the one that I'm kind of um, glumming onto and most interested in pertains to kelp farming because there are a couple of really small kelp farms and that's made to actually capture carbon out of the atmosphere um, and, and clean, up our, clean up the earth that way. Um, and so we're gonna be donating a portion of the proceeds to that. And this is a wine that I'm gonna continue to make and continue to grow. There's fortunately a lot of Pinot Noir available in the Willamette Valley and a lot of it is grown organic. It's, I've been focusing on only purchasing organic sites and actually this version is made out of two biodynamic sites, um, but uh, supporting those small growers that are willing to do organic farming and then helping and putting a little bit of the proceeds towards, um, towards the ocean is the goal with this wine. And tasting good and you know, <laughs> all the other things that wine should do already, so. Yeah, and it does. We've had trouble keeping this on the shelf, actually. Uh, and for those of you who like it, I think we're down to four bottles. I got to talk to our distributor tomorrow to see exactly what's left for all of these, um, because, again, they are tiny, tiny quantities. Uh, if you do fall in love with anything, I would go ahead and pre-order now in the chat uh, via Aaliyah, or you can order online or give us a call um, 
tomorrow at the store to secure your purchases um, while they're here. And, you know, as as you've learned, uh, they come and they go. But the exciting part is, you know, we'll have this now to look forward to next year. Once we run out this year, we'll be looking forward to the release next year when they come out. Uh, and it is, it, it's, it's what I fell in love with as, uh, Oregon Pinot Noir. It's just beautiful, ethereal, elegant, so it's, complex. It's two sites that I've been working with for a while. It's Johan and Mamtazi. And it's interesting because those two sites are so different in what they express of Pinot Noir. Um, almost all the identical clones, but just the soils and location that the Pinot uh, manifests itself in such a different way at the two sites. The Johan always tends to be really high toned red fruit and spice. Like there's a lot of like incense and pepper and I use about 30% whole cluster from both sites. And I think it's the stems actually at Johan that give it the real spiciness. Um, Momtazi always goes to more this like violet and dark fruit thing. But when I drink this wine, I see both of those things show up. I see all of those things show up. And for me, knowing the site so well, it can feel very much like um, watching a tennis match almost. I'm like, there's Johan, there's Montazi, there's Johan, there's Montazi. And I'm not saying that any everybody is going to notice that. But um, for me, because I, I am so familiar with the sites, it, it's very cool for me to see both of those things happening. And we just sold out of all four bottles that we have in the store. Uh, so I'm, I'm reaching out to the distributor right now to see what more we can get at Deep Blue. Um, because well, if, specialty, if specialty doesn't have any, I yep. do have a few cases that I could carve out for you guys also. Okay. So awesome. I, yeah, I've got a little bit at the winery still. So um, Love it. not much, but, yep. <laughs> but I, could, I, could get, I could get a little more for you guys. So for those of you who are fans, uh, good news, there will be more Deep Blue Pinot coming to Georgia at some point in time. If it's not here already, we will get some more of it uh, before the end of the year, for sure. Yum. It's, it's tasted really good today. I mean, not, if I really say so myself. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, it's, it's dynamite, and I want this with... Oh man, mushroom and Gruyere bruschetta, Aaliyah, seriously, where do you come up with this stuff? Um, that is just, oh yeah. Cedar and Point salmon, salmon also, yeah. a pino and salmon for me is like, that's just a, a given, like that's a yes. And uh, yep. yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Amen. Mm. All right, last but not least. Well, if I didn't make you cry talking about the fires and about all that <laughs> stuff, I'm going to make you cry now because nice. uh, this wine, <laughs> I wish I had, I'm sorry I didn't send you a picture. Um, I was so, I, I forgot. I didn't even think about it, but this wine I specifically made in 2017 for my son. Um, and uh, when I was pregnant with him, um, I was thinking about um, I wanted to make a wine that would age well enough that um, he could drink it when he was older. I mean, um, or taste it. Or if he has any interest right now, he gets mad and yells at me. If I say, you want to taste something? He's like, no. But uh, at some point he might want to. Um, anyhow, uh, so I was looking around for a fuller bodied red, um, but that had good acid to it so that it would have some ageability potential. And um, I was contacted by a friend of mine in the industry, a guy named uh, Marcus Goodfellow, who has a winery called uh, Goodfellow Family, something like that. It formerly was called Metello. And Marcus had been working with this fruit for many years. And I sold a lot of it when I was waiting tables because I always, I, I really loved it. Um, it's from, a vineyard called Duver that's in the Willamette Valley. Again, Syrah in the Willamette Valley is, is fairly atypical, but um, it produces a wine that's, uh, in my opinion, got more of those Northern Rhone kind of things to it uh, because of the cool, coolness of the climate. Um, and so uh, when Vigo was born, he, uh, he was born August 11th and he was 17 days old when I first 
took him out into vineyards. Um, and this was one of the sites that we went to. And I always told him like, this is your wine, this is for you. And I mean, he was tiny. It's so funny, I look back on it and it's like, I was so used to talking to him while I was pregnant and talking to him like once he was born that I felt like I had this like relationship with him already even though he was so tiny. And I look back on these pictures and I'm like, that's so funny because I was telling him everything about it. I'm like, honey, this is what we're doing <laughs> and doing pijage with him in a baby Bjorn and stuff. and. Uh, so this wine um, was was made for Vigo and it's called a Perido afternoon because he was born uh, in an af afternoon in August. He was born at 4.23 p.m. and Perido is the August August birthstone. So that's uh, that's who it's for. Um, <laughs> My daughter's and, uh, also an August baby and I was sitting in really? Perido. That's very specific. You don't hear that very often. And now this is now, yes, I'm emotional now. So continue what you're saying. How old is your daughter? She'll be three this August. Oh my God, that's so sweet. You know, I made a 2018 version of this wine. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm just saying. Just, I love, and Syrah's one of my favorites, so. She'll be three. So she was born in 2019. 2018. Oh, 2018. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's right. Beagle before. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, but I knew the site because of Marcus and there's another uh, winemaker who I'm friends with in the Valley, a guy named Todd Hamina who had worked with the site and they both said that site needs time. Um, and so uh, it did. Uh, I tasted it while it was in barrel. Again, I used um, mostly punchins on this and um, it was in barrel for about 30 months because it just took a long time to develop and open up. Um, and yeah, and, and I think uh, patience was a good thing um, in, for, for this particular wine. Yeah, it, it reminds me, honestly, a lot of uh, Texier's Cote Roti. Um, oh, my God. Seriously. It, that's why yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I know, I know. Uh, but it does. The nose, the aromatics. Um, obviously, we're not in Rhone and we're in Willamette, but the, the personality of it reminds me a lot of... Uh, that wine it's beautiful um, Thank you. I, I i've met eric and uh he's a he's a cool dude and he makes some really good wines and he's uh, a hoot yeah he is a hoot. i met him and um uh golly um domaine de la Cou, which apparently i always say wrong um what's fred um fred uh i can't remember his last name but i met the two of them together they are a mischievous couple of dudes. <laughs> Fred Niger, that's his name. That's his name. He's in, he's in Muscadet. So he, he mm. makes the uh, de la coup. Yeah. I love the black pepper and the, uh, the wild animal kind of characteristic in there. Uh, really, really classic Syrah. Um, mm. It's showing a, for me a lot of sweet herbs right now, like uh, lavender yeah. and like sweet thyme, which I think is really fun. I like that kind of, um, I guess they would call it Garrick in, uh, in France, um, yep. that kind of like wild herb kind of um, element to it. The 2018 version uh, is even a little bit darker than this one and has like a lot of the black olive component. Um, and that's, something that's hard to come by in domestic Syrah. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty fun that that's happening. It's exciting. Hmm. Are you, are you going to continue making this one? The vineyard got sold and I don't have access to that fruit anymore, but I love making one for Vigo. So I certainly am looking for new fruit to become this wine. And yeah. since it's about him and it's about making wines that can age for him. Um, I'm open to the potential that that could be a different variety. For instance, I would love to work with Nebbiolo, um, but I, I don't really know of any. I, I mean, I have Nero d'Avola that somebody planted for me in Southern Oregon, and I'm really interested in seeing more Italian varieties get planted in Southern Oregon. So it's possible or it's possible I find more Willamette Valley Syrah and make it as this, so. We'll have to see. Yeah, I've I have seen one Nebbiolo from uh, 
Nightshade or Division. Um, yeah, Division, Tom Monroe. That, yeah. That was freaking awesome. Uh, well, I think we we'll talked to with Tom about about wines for our boys because Tom's wife just had a baby about like five or six months ago and they're making a, like a reserve Nebbiolo for, for little Max also. Nice. And we were, we were actually chatting about that. Um, yeah, it's hard to come by. It's the, yeah. the actual grape is hard to come by. So yep. it's, that's awesome. Well, and we Very had cool. another, um, another chat question it's, and I'm gonna add on to it is um, question was, do you buy all your fruit? And my addition to that question is, do you start with finding vineyards you want to work with, or do you start by looking for particular great varieties and then finding the vineyard that has what you're looking for? Um, it's, I, both have happened. Yes. I buy all the fruit that I work with. Um, I would say, um, at this point, I oftentimes, ah, I, it goes both ways because there are some sites that I've been working with for a while, like uh, Lane Vineyard in the Applegate Valley. I buy Tanat and Malbec from them and I have for a long time. And at some point, Vermentino became available at that site and I had wanted it. Um, and I had an established relationship with the grower. So I started buying Vermentino and Muscat. And then in 2019, they had a whole bunch of Chardonnay hanging out and uh, I hadn't intended on buying Applegate Valley Chardonnay, but I know the site and I like the grower and I found a wine that worked out of that fruit and now I'm buying all their Chardonnay. So that's happened. Um, but then I have other wines like my Lemonade Rosé that I started making last year, um, which is Pinot Noir. And um, I specifically went out in order to increase production on that wine and found organic Pinot Noir vineyards. So, I mean, my ears perk up a lot if a vineyard is biodynamic or organic, and I might try to work something in based on how they're farming. Um, and there's a lot of times when I hear about fruit and then I go, boo, 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 I could do this with that, you know? And it's like maybe something I hadn't even thought of, but it's just, uh, I get inspired by the fruit oftentimes. <laughs> Great lineup, awesome stories, uh, have loved every single minute of it. Now is the time of truth. Uh, the favorite part of our wine tasting, finding out what your favorite is, because uh, as we've found over the last three years, everybody has a different palate. Everybody has different uh, flavors that they're attracted to. You know, uh, she mentioned that her sister calls her when there's a restaurant wine list to ask what wine she would like. Uh, and we're here to help you find what wines you will like. So um, <clears throat> put your favorites in the chat function. Uh, I am pondering with difficulty, as always, uh, what my favorite is going to be. Aaliyah, I need your vote. Alex, when you're around, I need your vote. If you can hear me, uh, you are helping customers right now. So thank you very much for that. Um, and one last question for you while we're tabulating the votes. Uh, if people want to come see you when they're in Oregon, uh, how can they find you? Do you have a tasting room? Um, is it appointment only? Is it open to the public? Uh, yeah, I mean, gosh, those things have come and gone so much in the last year. I'm trying to remember <laughs> what we're doing right now. But yes, we have a tasting room. Uh, we're open seven days a week from 11 to 5. Uh, it's a better bet, particularly on the weekends, to make a reservation because we do get pretty busy. Um, but we generally have some space for walk-ins, but, you know, I'd love to hear from you and uh, particularly that you were a part of this tasting. So um, if you reach out via our website, which is daywines.com um, and send a note, I will get it and we can, uh, we can work it out and make something happen. That's awesome. I love it. And where is it located? Are you in? Uh, in Dundee, in Dundee, right in Dundee. on the main strip that goes through Dundee, which is called Highway 99W. I'm right there on the main strip. So cool. it's easy to find. Yeah. Love it. Um, all right. Uh, I am throwing my hat in. Uh, I got to go with the Syrah. I wanted to go with Tears of Vulcan so bad just because it's perfect for this time of year. But man, that Syrah is just dynamite. Um, really, really, really delicious. Uh, all right. What do we got, Aaliyah? Thanks. Thanks. This is a this this has actually been a very close tasting across the board for all of them. Everyone got every bottle got a vote. 
Um, but it looks like the Syrah has eked eked to the forefront of the of the conversation, provided I'm not missing anybody's votes. Uh, Brianne, what's your favorite today? Uh, today, oddly, uh, I mean, not oddly, but uh, I think Deep Blue is tasting outstanding today. I it mean, I'm, I'm really into uh, Peridot also. Um, yeah, I, I maybe I say oddly because normally I'm such a white wine drinker, but uh, the two reds are the ones that are kind of standing out to me right now. But I thought Deep yeah. Blue was like really in a good place right now. I love it. All right, who was number two? Or which uh, one? Uh, tied for Deep Blue and uh, Queen D. Nice. I love it. I love it. Uh, and I did just find out from the distributor that we do have uh, a few more cases available of the Deep Blue Pinots. So we'll be have we'll have some some I can't talk today. We'll have some more of that on Friday for you. Uh, the four bottles that we sold on the tasting are gone, uh, but there will be more on Friday. Uh, we do have a little bit left of all of the others in the store as well, uh, as well as the Day Orange, as well as the Vinda Days Blanc uh, and Baby Cheeks Rosé. So all of those are available to you. Uh, most of you have had them and love them. They're a lot of fun. If you haven't tried them, you should. The Orange is really, really delicious. The Cheers of Vulcan is awesome too, but the Vinda Days Orange is really, really fun. Um, and again, uh, Brianne, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us, to tell us about yourself, your wines, uh, love what you're doing. Please, please, please continue, uh, the fight. Um, and when you're in Atlanta, please look us up. If you want to follow her, uh, Facebook, Instagram, go see her in Willamette. Uh, and then when she's out here, we'll set up a tasting at the flight club and we'll have her in person when we can. Thank you so much for having me. This was really, really a joy. Thank you. You're welcome. Pleasure is all ours. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for your support. Uh, we love you. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, and keep drinking great wine and keep building community around that great wine. Uh, we'll see you next week for Rosé All Day. And Aaliyah, anything else that I'm missing? No. Awesome. <laughs> no, you got it. Y'all have a good evening. Have good a good night, night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.